for joining us, Christina. It's great to have you. Oh, but Priscilla Patton, she's one of our Minnesota authors. She's joining us from Northfield, Minnesota. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining us, Priscilla. So well, I'm Pamela Klingerhorn and welcome so much. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us so much for the Literature Lovers Luncheon today. It's not every day that you get to dine and enjoy the company of these absolutely amazing women today with their new books. I'm sure you have seen them. They've been well publicized in lots of magazines, newspapers, uh, TV programs, all kinds of things. So lots of excitement and I'm so thrilled that we were able to bring them all together for you in one program. So we still have a few more people who will be checking in. This program will be recorded. I know many people are working or it's not convenient right now. And so you can watch this at your leisure. And of course, you can order your books from Valley Bookseller at any time. I will be putting links to all of the titles in the chat box during the program. And you can just copy and paste those into your browser and easy one click shopping. Um, if you have a question for the authors today, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you move your cursor down there, if you're unfamiliar with a Zoom platform, move your cursor down and you'll see a little Q&A icon that is second from your right. And you can enter your question there. I'll be monitoring those and we'll take some questions during the program as well as afterwards. So don't worry that we will get all the questions asked and you will be able to get all the insider information that you have been dying to have about the social graces, the other Black girl and the startup wife today. So thank you again for joining us. And thank you from everyone at Valley Bookseller. We can't stay in business without your support for brick and mortar bookstores. And we appreciate every dollar you spend at independent bookstores and not online. Although you can shop online at Valley Bookseller. So anyway, I am Pamela Klingerhorn and welcome to the program. Today we have a little something for everyone. Renee Rosen is making a fourth return appearance at the Literature Lovers program today with another work of outstanding historical fiction. Zakia Delilah Harris is joining us from London and she Brooklyn, has actually. been, sorry, sorry, Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, you're in Brooklyn. Like, we're yeah, London. no, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> They, all right. Sorry, okay. everyone. She's in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard it earlier, but I was like, oh, no. I okay. <laughs> I had you in a more Sorry. soft location. Anyway, we're proud to have you wherever you are, Zakia. <laughs> and I'm sure you have seen lots of press about the other Black girl, including a Good Morning America book club selection. Our third author today is Tamima Aman, who is in London. <laughs> yes. And she is joining us with her new book, The Startup Wife. So we are very excited about the three of them. The Startup Wife is not even published yet. So this is actually a pre-publication event and you will be able to order your copy and either pick it up or have it sent to you on release day. So you will be in the know immediately. So anyway, during the program, as I said, I will put shopping links into the chat box. You can put your questions into the Q&A box and I will be monitoring all of those. So don't forget, sign books make a great gift. We have book plates from both Renee Rosen and Zakia Harris at Valley Bookseller, and we will include those with your purchase, whether it is online or in the store until they run out. So our first author today is going to be Renee Rosen. So we will say goodbye for a moment to Tamima and Zakia as they turn off their monitors for a second. And now here's Renee. Renee is the only author to now have appeared at the Literature Lover program four times. And that is because she sells out of her work every time she comes. <laughs> she has promised us today another one of her excellent PowerPoint presentations. She is the best-selling author of Park Avenue Summer. This time, she is throwing back the curtain on one of the most remarkable feuds in history. And I don't mean the Hatfields and the McCoys. This is Mrs. Vanderbilt and Mrs. Astor's notorious battle for control of New York society during the Gilded Age. The Social Graces is well-researched and absolutely gripping, and it's a look at the glory days of old New York. Let's welcome Renee Rosen, Alva Vanderbilt, and Caroline Astor to the Literature Lovers Luncheon. Thank you, Renee. 
Thanks for having me back. You know, the last time I was at Literature Lovers Night Out, I was actually working on the social graces. And I remember uh, sitting by the pool and really just, we were brainstorming on the opening of the social graces. So it's great to be back. Um, I only wish I could be there in person. Um, but one of the things that I love so much about this event, and it is one of my favorites, is that you get to hear so many of the authors share their journey to publication. So I thought I would share just a, a little bit of insight um, into my background. I've always known that I wanted to be a writer from the time I was a little girl. And I was always making up stories and writing poems and little plays. And you can ask my childhood friends, no one wanted to play Barbies with me because they just wanted to put on the clothes and the outfits. And I was very concerned with the storyline. You know, uh, Barbie and Ken cannot go to Paris right now because they had a fight and that needs to be resolved. And they're also having financial problems. So, um, I, the, the passion for writing and storytelling has been with me from the time I was a little girl. Um, so while I've always known that I wanted to be a writer, I didn't know it was gonna take so long. I had over 300 rejections before I got an agent. And then I got, uh, took another two years to sell the book. Then it took another five years before I found a home at Berkeley. So uh, despite the fact that it's an up and down and it's been a long road, there's nothing I would rather do. Um, so with that, let me uh, share with you my uh, presentation here for the social graces. Um, so as Pamela said, the social graces is a story about uh, two women, Caroline Astor and Alva Vanderbilt vying for control of New York society during the Gilded Age. It's also a story about ladies behaving badly. So before we get into the meat of it, we need to talk a little bit about why society mattered. So society really uh, served a purpose for these women. It's the 1870s to the early 1900s. It's a time when women really didn't have any rights. They couldn't vote. They didn't own property. Uh, they didn't work outside the home. They're really beholden to their husbands and fathers. Um, and the one thing that they had was society. And society was a venue where women and was could exercise some sort of control. They could, uh, they got to call the shots. They planned the dinner parties. They planned the menu, the guest list, the decorations, the entertainment, etc. And the more celebrated the hostess, the more powerful the woman. And of course, no one was more powerful during the Gilded Age than Caroline Astor. So she went by the name of Mrs. Astor or the Mrs. Astor as she liked to be called. And she and her sidekick here on the right, uh, Ward McAllister, were the gatekeepers of society. They determined who was in and who was out. And they went so far as to create a list of 400 people that they deemed were worthy of being in society. Now, ironically, Alva Vanderbilt was not included on that list. So you might ask, well, why she was a Vanderbilt? Clearly she had the money, she had the prestige. Why wasn't she included in society? Well, society was broken into two camps. You had the Knickerbockers or the old money. These were people who were, uh, their ancestors were the original Dutch settlers of New York. And they were considered American royalty. So Caroline Astor was a Knickerbocker. And she did not like the nouveau riche or the new money. And that was post-Civil War, you had the industrialists, you had Rockefeller, you had uh, uh, Carnegie, you had JP Morgan, you had the Vanderbilts who were railroad money. And Caroline firmly believed that one's wealth should be inherited, not earned. And I think that's a great gig if you can get it. Uh, but she really looked down on railroad money. And she looked down on the nouveau riche. She thought they were really flashy and they were always flaunting their wealth. My God, they ate their peas with a fork rather than a fork and knife. So she wanted nothing to do with them. And plus she had four daughters to marry off. And she certainly did not want her daughters uh, mixing with the nouveau riche. Now, Alva took great offense at this, at being excluded. And this is what kicked off the rivalry between the two women. 
And because not only did Alva want in society, she wanted to topple Caroline and take over society. So one thing about society, there were only two seasons. There was winter and Newport. So the Newport season lasted roughly about six weeks. And this is where the upper crust, they went to Newport, Rhode Island for their summer getaway. And they had these cottages. Um, and you see here what they considered a cottage for six weeks. For six weeks, the average woman brought 90 ball gowns with her to get her through the season. Now this top uh, right-hand corner is Caroline's uh, cottage called Beechwood. It was on Bellevue Avenue and it's very lovely. And you can see next to it was her, ball, uh, her ballroom. Again, lovely, but Alva wanted to get under her skin. So she buys the land right next to Beechwood on Bellevue Avenue and she creates Marble House. And Marble House just, it's twice the size of Beechwood. You see uh, her ballroom compared to Caroline's ballroom, it's all gilded. Um, this is just a little bit more of a look inside Marble House. You can see the entranceway. Uh, it's just a little over the top. Um, and the stairwell and her dining room where those chairs each weighed 75 pounds a piece. Uh, they needed footmen to help her guests in and out and Alva's bedroom. Now, Alva really loved architecture and had she been a man, she would have been an architect, but she started building and outbuilding Caroline even before this. So we go to the next slide and you see this home in the upper uh, right-hand corner and uh, the upper left-hand corner, sorry. And that was Carol, uh, Alva's Petite Chateau, which was on Fifth Avenue. Um, and because Caroline Astor had never invited Alva to her annual balls or the patriarch balls, Alva devised a plan that she was going to throw a huge housewarming party and she was going to invite everyone but Caroline's uh, young daughter. And this was a marriage mart here. So uh, Carrie Astor had to be at this ball and Alva really used her daughter, Mrs. Astor's daughter as a pawn and got her to the ball. And this ball was, it eclipsed Caroline Astor's annual ball. Alva spent $11,000 on uh, flowers, $65,000 on champagne. The whole thing cost her about $250,000 back in the day, which would have been the equivalent of about $6 million today. And it was a masquerade ball which was very different. And everybody went running for to their dressmakers for outfits. And these are some of uh, my favorite outfits from uh, costumes from the ball. So you see Alva, she's got the doves. She was a Venetian princess. Her sister-in-law came as a torch, uh, a light, an electric light, and she's holding a torch up. And that torch actually had a pocket switch that she could illuminate it. Uh, there was a woman who came as a hornet with diamonds encrusted in her uh, headpiece. The men were just as excited about it as the women. They went all, all out for it. But I think the costume award goes to this woman in the bottom corner. Her name was Kate Strong. Her nickname was Puss. I don't know if you can see, but on her choker, there's a diamond uh, spelled out puss because she loved all things feline. She loved all things feline so much that she came dressed as a cat. She has a taxidermied cat on her head and about a dozen tails that were stitched into her outfit. So I think she gets the award for, uh, for best costume. And this ball was such a success that it kicked off an era of just crazy balls where all the hostesses decided they needed a theme for their ball as well. So there was the hat ball where people wore very elaborate hats and then they went to colors. So there was the royal blue, blue ball, the uh, white ball or the blanc ball, the rouge ball where everyone wore red. And when they ran out of colors, they decided to bring in animals. So somebody brought an elephant to their uh, ball. There was also a mysterious uh, ball for the uh, Prince Del Drago of Corsica. And no one knew who this prince was because he turned out to be a chimpanzee. Um, there was the dog ball where owners brought their dogs with uh, diamond encrusted collars. Um, and the humans sat at one table and the dogs all sat at another table. And 
they sat down, they feasted, some of the dogs overindulged and had to be carried out. Um, and one of my favorite balls was the horse ball. And you see this image here. This was held at Sherry's restaurant, which was one of the most upscale restaurants in New York at the time. And they put hay and dirt on the floor. They brought the horses in on an elevator. Each guest got a horse with a saddlebag of champagne and a long tube so they could sip their champagne. Now, what they did with uh, the manure that night, I have no idea, but I can tell you that there was never another horse ball. Um, and, you know, this just was so over the top. Uh, the balls went on until dawn. And uh, one thing I can tell you is that when the upper crust was not going to balls, they were behaving very badly. And in 1880, there started this new trend in newspapers and it was called the society news and there were suddenly gossip columns so all the scandals that sort of went viral gilded age style that you'll find in the book came straight out of the headlines and i don't want to give too many spoilers away but let's just say it was uh an era of adultery it was a time of duels you'll read about some divorces. Um, and, you know, it was just, it, it really changed the way uh, society operated because now they were being watched. And um, I want to bring this talk, I'm, I'm really excited to get to the other two authors. And so I want to bring my talk back around full circle here. I told you that it was 300 rejections and that it was a long road. So I wanted to introduce you to my book babies. So um, my first book was Every Crooked Pot. It came out in 2007. It took uh, 17 years to write. And before that book was published, I had started working on Dollface. That one took 10 years to write. My mother said, if you wanna make a living at this, you're, you better start picking up the pace. And by then I had found a home with Berkeley. And um, I, after Dollface, which is the story of a flapper who falls in love with two mobsters from rival gangs during Prohibition Chicago, I wrote What the Lady Wants, which is about the retail tycoon Marshall Field, who had a 30-year love affair with his neighbor, who was 20 years his junior. And then I wrote White Collar Girl, which is a story of a young journalist who, uh, works at the Chicago Tribune, but it's the 1950s. And because she's a woman, she is relegated to society news. And uh, she um, gets a secret source inside the daily machine. And she starts scooping all the men. And then from there, I wrote a, another book set in Chicago called Windy City Blues, um, which has a very special place in my heart. This is an interracial love story wrapped around the birth of the Chicago blues and the birth of the civil rights movement. And from there, I metaphorically moved to New York and I wrote Park Avenue Summer, which is sort of man, Mad Men meets the Devil Wears Prada. It's the story of a young girl who goes to New York City and takes a job as uh, Helen Gurley Brown's first secretary when Helen Gurley Brown originally took over as the editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan Magazine. And we just discussed the social graces. And my next book is, um, and I owe uh, credit to Pamela who came up with the, the title, Gift with Purchase. It's a novel of Estee Lauder, which comes out in uh, 2023. At least that's the working title. We'll see if, if that holds. But um, so that's a little bit of background about me and um, I will wrap it up here and looking forward to hearing Tamina and Zakaya speak. Well, don't go away just yet, Renee. Okay, I'm going to stop my screen share. Okay, there we go. Great. Yes. Now, one of our guests today is asking if there are any of these photographs actually included in the novel. Oh, I wish. No, no, but no. Are they no. on your website but, if they want to go back and look at them again? Um, I post them all over social media. So if you follow me on social media, you'll be able to see a lot of them. Um, and I do have a family tree, though, which will help you keep all the Williams and the Corneliuses straight because uh, they were very unimaginative when it came to naming people. Everybody had the same names. So there is that in the front of the book very for both the Astors and the Vanderbilts. 
And are any of these magnificent homes still in existence for people to tour? Yes, if you go to Newport, Newport is really a time capsule of the Gilded Age and you can tour Marble House. Unfortunately, uh, Beachwood, Caroline Astor's home was sold to a private individual and it's being renovated into, um, I believe it's going to be an art gallery. Um, so unfortunately you can't tour that, but there's the elms, there's the breakers, which makes Marble House look like a closet. Um, and uh, it's, it's fabulous. And it really gives you the spirit of how these people lived and just how over, top, over the top their lifestyles were. Well, congratulations. It's an absolutely spellbinding book. I just sat down and tore right through it in one sitting. It's wonderful. It's my new favorite of your work. Oh, uh, thank you. So, and everyone, I put the link for shopping in the um, chat box and it is a paperback original. So very easy for traveling, gift giving, um, stocking up for your book club. Renee does visit book clubs. And so mm -hmm. I believe there's contact information on your website. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Renee. Thank Appreciate you. That. We will see you again towards the end for more questions. Yep. Okay. We did have a question that came to me during the conversation, and the people were wondering how these three women were chosen for the program together. Well, it's a very technical process. It's the books that I happen to like the most. <laughs> and then I invite the authors, and if the authors are available, we put them on the program together. And this month, I was quite enamored with these three titles, and I was fortunate enough to be able to access all three of the authors and put them on a panel. So we have a little something for everyone today with historical fiction, contemporary fiction, a little bit of a thriller, some romance, everything. So um, I think if you buy all the books on today's panel, it's going to keep you reading for quite some time. So let's head off now and see our second author. So Tamima Anam can please turn on her camera and microphone. Welcome. Tamima is in London. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why we're having lunch today, because otherwise it gets far too late when it's seven o'clock in Minnesota and one o'clock in the morning in London. So we appreciate you joining us for lunch. And her biography or her bio caught my attention on the back of the book when it arrived because it said that she went to Mount Holyoke College and so did I. So as a fellow uncommon woman, that's the catchphrase for Mount Holyoke, um, I absolutely had to read her work and I was so thrilled and excited about it. And I hope all of you saw Lori Herzl in the Star Tribune's summer reading roundup. She included the startup wife in there and um, it's definitely should be on your list to read. Um, this is Tamima's fourth novel. She wrote A Golden Age, A Good Muslim, The Bones of Grace, and now The Startup Wife from Scribner, which comes out in just a couple of weeks. So you will be able to pre-order it today and pick it up or have it delivered to you on publication day. Tamima is long listed for the Man Asian Literary Prize. Her short story Garments won the O. Henry Award and was shortlisted for the BBC National Short Story Award. And Tamima was a 2016 judge for the prestigious Man Booker Award. She's also a very well-known journalist with op-ed columns in the New York Times, The Guardian, and The New Statesman. Um, where she writes about Bangladesh and its growing problems. Today, Tamima will be presenting her hot new title, A Startup Wife. I'm going to quote from her publisher, Simon & Schuster. In this gripping, blistering novel, award-winning author Tamima Anam takes on faith and future with a gimlet eye and a deft touch. Come for the radical vision of human connection, stay for the wickedly funny feminist look at startup culture and modern partnership. Please join me in welcoming Tamima Aman. Thank you, Tamima. Thank you so much, Pamela. And thank you all so much for being here. It's such a thrill. Um, I am in London, so many, many miles away and also a few weeks from publication. So you're getting a little sneak preview into my new book. Um, so the way that I describe this book is I call it a feminist rom-com satire. Um, and what is a feminist rom-com satire, you might ask? Um, 
it basically uh, means that the central character, um, who's called Asha Ray, uh, the novel um, is is basically based all around her, and Asha is like the girl of my dreams. Okay, and one of the great things that you can do as a writer is um, you can make your characters into all the things that you you wish you were. Um, so Asha is like a smarter, sassier, more confident version of me. Um, she's a brilliant computer coder and she kind of moves through the world with a kind of self-possession uh, that I that I got to write, that I really enjoyed writing into her. Um, she is the daughter of Bangladeshi immigrants. She grows up in Queens. Her parents own a pharmacy. Um, and when we meet her, she's about to create a new kind of artificial intelligence algorithm. She's very, very clever. And um, she's sort of doing her PhD and then right at the start of the novel, she re-meets her high school crush. And this is obviously a guy that she's been sort of thinking about um, since she was in high school. And then she sees him again and they she instantly falls back in love with him. Um, so that's where the sort of wrong part of the story begins. Um, and he's called Cyrus Jones. And much to her surprise and delight, this time around, he falls back in love with her. And they have a totally whirlwind romance. And then on a whim, about a few weeks after they meet again, they decide to get married. So Asha becomes a wife. Now, Cyrus um, uh, has a very interesting, you can't really call it a job. He's kind of made up this career for himself. And his, Asha calls him a humanist spirit guide. And what that means is that he makes up rituals for people um, who don't adhere or conform to any sort of particular organized religion. So um, one of the examples in the book is that he, there are these two classicists and they want to get married and he makes up a, a ritual that's based around the Odyssey and it's got um, elements of Greek mythology and the story of the Odyssey and literature and history all kind of woven together um, into this very special kind of wedding ceremony. And he is the kind of officiant of this ceremony. Um, so Asha goes to this wedding and watches Cyrus do this thing. And she has an idea and she says, well, maybe I could turn Cyrus's you know, unusual amalgamation of human ritual into a kind of AI code. Um, and I'm just going to read to you for one minute, if that's okay, from the novel. And this is the moment when she kind of hatches this plan and they're living with their best friend, Jules. And the, the novel is kind of about these three characters and how they launch this startup. So I got a letter today from some people in Missouri, Cyrus said. He started reading the letter aloud. Dear Cyrus, my wife and I grew up watching Little House on the Prairie and we both have this yearning to kneel beside our bed at night and say some kind of prayer. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that without summoning a higher power? Could we do that? Could we just do that and enjoy it? We don't wanna cheat on our atheism. Gee, Cy, if only you could give every skeptic what they wanted, some kind of believable replacement for God, Jules said. Well, I said, I did propose that to Cyrus, but he wasn't sure. I didn't say it wasn't sure. I said, I don't wanna be a priest. Jules looked back and forth between me and Cyrus. You want to give this man his own religion? I just said I could code an algorithm that would allow people to get a kind of Cyrus ritual, you know, a combination of all their things wrapped up in a little modern package without the sexism, homophobia, and burning in the fires of hell of actual religion. You know, Jules agreed, that's not a bad idea. People might actually go for that. I shrugged. It's up to Cyrus. What's wrong, Cy? You don't want to be the new messiah? So um, they launched this thing. Um, they call it Y, um, which, which is pronounced Y as in why are we all here, but it's spelled W-A-I, we are infinite. And um, they're in, they launch it kind of in a really small way. And they're invited at this point to join a secret tech incubator called Utopia. So they go to New York and they join this incubator. And Utopia is full of other companies, full of other brilliant ideas. 
And the brief, uh, what brings them all together is that they're preparing for life after an apocalypse. So they're kind of like preppers. So there are all kinds of companies. There's a man, he's like a vegan activist. He's building, um, he's growing vegetables with electricity. Um, there's a woman who's, um, you know, she runs the, she runs Utopia, but she also comes up with all these very quirky ideas. Um, she builds a vitamin vape so you can pretend to smoke, but actually you're getting vitamins. So all kinds of things. Um, one of them is called Consentify, where you have to agree beforehand to the sexual activity you're going to engage in. This is making the future kind of safer and building ideas about the future to, to, to rebuild the world in a better way once the apocalypse has ruined it, broken everything. Um, so this was where kind of the, the comedy part of the novel came in. Um, I had such a great time making up all the companies that go inside Utopia. All of my sort of random ideas for tech companies um, came in um, and I kind of got carried away with it actually. Um, I built a fake website that has all the companies in it and I'll put, I'll put the web address in the chat and you can go and look at them all yourself. A, a personal favorite and one that a lot of other people have enjoyed is the silent vibrator called Flitter. Um, so anyway, so that's Utopia. Um, and Cyrus, Jules and Asha join Utopia and then they launch their platform and much to their surprise, it totally takes off. It becomes a huge success. People sign up by the millions and pretty soon they're pushed into the limelight. Um, except, surprise, surprise, Cyrus starts to get all the credit. And it's not because he takes anything away from Asha. In fact, she kind of, she, you know, she's a bit nerdy and she's like, oh, Cyrus, you be the CEO. I'm just the coder and I'm not really good at being a sort of public figure and anyway you're the guy who inspired it all so why don't you do it and Cyrus becomes the leader and because it's a little bit of a religious a little bit of a culty kind of thing people don't just see him as a visionary CEO they see him as um, a prophet you know like a messiah uh, like what Jewel said what you don't want to be the new messiah and actually that kind of is what happens um, so this is a then where the satire part of the novel comes in. Um, and before I tell you about that, I should probably be transparent about my own involvement in the startup world because some of the story will make, uh, you know, give you a little bit of context. So about 10 years ago, right around the time we got married, um, my husband founded a music tech company um, and he was a totally unlikely entrepreneur. You know, we were both gonna be academics. I had done my PhD in anthropology and he had studied philosophy. But then he invented this thing and he very, in a very kind of happenstance way, launched this tech company. And because neither of us any, had any idea what we were doing, he put me on the board of the company and I've been on the board ever since. And so I have had this kind of insider outsider view into the tech world. Um, so I've been at board meetings, I've been at investment pitches, I've listened to founders and VCs talk about valuations and disruption, all the possibilities of tech. Um, and one of the things that I discovered about the tech world, and those of you who are involved in it will know that the word that is the most sacred word in the tech world is disruption. Okay, people in tech wanna disrupt everything. They wanna change the way we order our food, the way we communicate with our loved ones, the way we work, eat, sleep, everything. And the world is full of hyperbole. Um, you know, the, when you're in a tech startup, the, you talk about, you use things like, um, killing it, you know, we're gonna kill it, crushing it. Um, there's the monster valuation, there's the huge exit. And of course, the much longed for unicorn. If you don't know what a unicorn is, it's when your company has a billion dollar valuation and it's actually called unicorn. Um, it was so easy to sat satirize that world. Um, just observing it from the outside, I hardly had to make up any of the jokes. Um, and like Cyrus and Asha, my husband and I had to figure out a way to balance our startup and our marriage. Um, of course, it was a totally different situation because I didn't really have anything to do with that company. I was just sort of sitting on the sidelines and supporting him and helping him make certain strategic decisions. I didn't develop any of the technology or anything. Um, but I was still some, sometimes overwhelmed by the space that the startup was taking in our lives. It was almost like having another child. Um, and of course we have actual children, so life is a constant balance. Um, and one of the ways that I dealt with this 
was by writing about it. Um, I mean, I think if you ask any writer, um, you know, did the story come from your life? Is it autobiographical? Um, you'll get a range of answers. You'll get some people saying, yeah, you know, this was really based on my experience and others who say, you know, I write speculative fiction it has nothing to do with me. But I think the truth is that every writer, um, even if they don't write about events that happen to them, they have put something of their life experience into a book and the books and the writing happens within their lives. Um, so for me, writing The Startup Wife, it wasn't just that I was getting like actual material from my life. It was that, you know, I'm sitting in a boardroom and someone says something a little bit sexist. And one of my classic favorite ones is when people would ask me where my children were as if I had just kind of forgotten them on the street on my way over there. They'd be like, hey, how's it going? Where are the kids? I'd be like, I'm at work. <laughs> Obviously, I know where they are, but they're not here. I have a job here. Anyway, um, I get that question a lot. It's, it's a very um, deceptively sort of sexist kind of question. Anyway, um, so whenever something like that happened, I got to think to myself, I'm going to write that down or I'm going to put that somewhere. And it kind of like, it made me feel like I was a bit of an undercover agent. Um, so even though the, a lot of those anecdotes didn't actually make it into the book, um, it they knowing that I was writing the book was something that gave me a lot of joy um, in those 10 years that I had that experience. Um, so yeah, it was a really fun experience writing the book. Having said that, when I finally thought about publishing a book, I got really scared. And um, that's going back to the description I gave you at the beginning. I have never written a comedy, much less a romantic comedy. And I have certainly never attempted satire. Um, one of my major concerns was, is it gonna be funny? Are people gonna laugh? And then my, I had the sort of opposite concern, which was that if they do laugh, does that mean that no one will ever take me seriously again? Um, Pamela very generously mentioned my earlier books and I have written very serious literary fiction set in my home country of Bangladesh. And, you know, as a writer of color, as a person from a small country that doesn't get written about much, people expect me to write a certain kind of book. They expect me to perform a kind of cultural translation for them. Um, and I totally get that. And I wrote three books that were essentially, you know, set in my home country. They were about the war of independence. And I felt very deeply committed to those stories. It's just that I also have another side of myself, which is that I grew up in Queens and I'm part of this tech world and I wanted to reflect that. And sometimes it's hard for writers or anyone to bring their whole selves to an artistic project. And this was me trying to bring this other side of me. Um, but it can be a little bit scary. And I, I was worried that um, it, was, it was not gonna be the right decision. And in fact, I was so worried that I asked my agent to send the book out under a pseudonym. And then I asked my publisher to publish it under a pseudonym. And of course they very wisely said no. And they said, you know, um, we respect all, all parts of you. And that there is a direct correlation between those books and this one. They're all about women finding their voices and kind of owning their power. Um, so this is going to go out under your name and you just have to figure out a way to deal with it and talk about it, which is what I'm doing now. Um, so back to Cyrus and Asha. Uh, what happens when two people find huge international fame and success? What happens when they do something that actually has a major impact on the world? Can they stay together? How do they share power? How do they navigate the world? And I guess the central question is, as a rom-com, it's not will they get together, but will they stay together? Do we even want them as readers to stay together? And most importantly, um, if they do stay together, how can Asha find her voice? How can she find her power? That is the central, um, that is the central question that the novel is asking. Um, and I guess you, hopefully you're gonna read it and find the answer to that question. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Tamima. I just thought 
your novel was so thought provoking. It gave me so many things to contemplate and I was dying to find somebody else who could read it so I could discuss it with them right away if I was still fresh in my mind. Great characters. I just really, really loved it. And I was so honored that you agreed to do a pre-publication event. So this is your very first event. So I'm hoping that all your friends and fans will want to tune in and hear all about the excitement for this one. It's really great. And like I said, the Star Tribune here in the Twin Cities really loved it and recommended it for summer. Now, do you um, meet with book clubs over Zoom? Um, you know, it's not something that um, is very common in the UK as a sort of way of, you know, getting out there, but I'm definitely happy to do it. And if any always... of your US fans wanted to invite you, is that of something course. that they can contact you through your website? Absolutely, yeah, it's Great. the startupwife.com. It's just um, the book website. So yeah, absolutely. Happy Very to. exciting. And that's coming on July 13th from Scribner, part of Simon & Schuster. So we're really excited about that one. Thank you so much. Don't go away because we will have you back at the end for Q&A. But we are now going to move on to our third author. Here she is, Sophia Delilah Harris. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a very big battle as to see which stores were going to get Zakia because as soon as I read the book, I emailed her publicist with whom I've had the pleasure of working quite a few times. And I said, I know this is gonna get picked up by one of the celebrity book clubs. <laughs> and I wanna make sure she's also on Literature Lovers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pamela. It's oh. been, I'm amazed and wondered, just overcome with emotions about oh. being here. So I'm very excited, oh, excited for you to have me. Well, I think we'll show your book trailer quickly and then I'll come okay. back and finish my introduction for you. So Sounds hang better. on while I do the screen share because as we know, screen sharing is never quite as smooth as you're hoping. No, um, it always goes smoothly in the dress rehearsal. And then when it's- <laughs> Are you seeing the screen share yet? No, not no, at this not moment. Okay. All right, hang on. Let's see here. All right. Now share. There we go. There we go. I'm going to pull it up big. Okay, now we're going to start it. Pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. And I know the sound wasn't that loud, so I can just give you an idea of what it was like. Burr, there's that thriller energy, everyone. <laughs> my sound was loud, so I don't know what the audience thought. But anyway. <laughs> Maybe it's just my end. But thank Maybe. you so much. <laughs> yes, thanks for joining us. I mean, if you have not yet heard of The Other Black Girl, I think you must have really been staying off of any kind of media or living in a cave because it has been everywhere. It was an instant new. New York Times bestseller. Congratulations on that. That is Thank just you. amazing for a debut. Good Can't Morning America, <laughs> Esquire, Read with Marie Claire, Book Club Pick, People Best Book of Summer. Um, it was named the most anticipated book by Time, The Washington Post, Harper's Bazaar, Entertainment Weekly, Marie Claire, Bustle, Parade, Goodreads, Fortune, and the BBC. Um, the publisher, Atria Books, is billing it as Get Out meets the devil wears Prada. I mean, what kind of a fantastic title <laughs> is that? It's so electric and exciting and tension filled and it just grips you from the get go about two young black women in the publishing world set in this completely starkly white arena. And it's just mm -hmm. incredible. So I am not gonna say another word. I'm gonna let you take it away. Dakia Harris, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you again, um, Samima, Renee. It's so amazing to be here with you today. I love hearing about your stories behind your stories. Um, and thank you everyone for, for tuning in and thank you Valley Booksellers. So yes, uh, as Pamela mentioned, The Other Black Girl is, uh, it's a Devil Wears Prada meets Get Out um, book. Uh, I say also it's a horror-tinged workplace thriller. I just try to cram 
all of the adjectives into the sentence because it is a lot of different things, which I will get into in a little bit. Um, but I'm gonna give you my little bit of an elevator pitch first. So the other black girl primarily follows Nella Rogers, who is a young 26 uh, year old editorial assistant who has been the only black person working at Wagner Books for the last two years. So this means a lot of different things. She grew up in Connecticut. Um, so she's used to navigating white spaces a lot. But as an older person in Wagner books, she is kind of tired of having to field all the microaggressions, uh, kind of have to speak for all Black people all over the world um, because she is the only one. So she is very excited when Hazel, another young Black woman who is from Harlem, has really beautiful dreadlocks, um, starts working in a cubicle next to hers. Nella thinks, awesome. I have an ally. I have someone I can complain about all these white people with in the office who are making these, these comments that can often be uncomfortable for her. Uh, but where's the story if it all goes well, right? Uh, it doesn't. Uh, things in the office start to get strange. Nella starts receiving weird notes at her desk and she starts to wonder if Hazel is a friend or a foe. Um, and also unfolding alongside Nella's story are the stories of three other Black women, Kendra Ray, who uh, was an editor at Wagner Books 30 years earlier, Diana, who is a best-selling author who worked with Kendra Ray at Wagner, um, and Shawnee, who is a young Black woman who has just been recently uh, fired from her magazine job in Boston. So they are all have chosen very different paths in life, all are very different um, Black women, but they are all bound by this very uh, chilling, dark secret that has implications for them, but also for Black people all over the world. Um, so this story, I have to say, is very close to me because I worked in publishing myself for uh, two and a half, close to three years, and I really enjoyed it. I have always wanted to be a writer for years and years. Um, and then as I got a little older, um, I did my undergrad, I majored in English Lit. When I did my MFA at the New School, I studied um, nonfiction writing. Um, but the thing that I loved about doing my MFA was getting to talk about writing, to talk about how to improve things, how to get sentences to where we wanted them to be, what was working, what wasn't working. Um, I loved doing that when I was in grad school and I always loved editing my own work. So publishing had always been something I'd always wanted to do or at least try out. But it is very hard to get a job in publishing. Um, very hard if you're not connected. I applied for so many summers to get into publishing um, internships, entry level positions, because I, I am from Connecticut, like my protagonist, Nella. Uh, you'll see there's some overlap between us. And um, whenever I came home from college, it made sense like, oh, commute you know, to the city to do those internships. But I never got a reply back. And it wasn't until I did my MFA when I had a professor who mentioned to me one day, it was like, you're writing so good, like uh, not good, good, but like <laughs> just like sound, like never had to really edit. Um, and she was like, have you ever considered working in editing? And I was like, have I considered it? Because I was so into that idea. Um, and a few months later, she had no talked to someone who knew someone as the, a lot of the, these media spaces are, you have to know someone who knows someone. Um, and it was a black woman who worked many floors up who was able to get, help get me an informational interview. And from there, I got another interview with the two bosses I worked for, two really great editors that I worked for. Uh, one was fiction and one was nonfiction. And I just hit the ground running. I really, really loved it. Um, I loved that I was able to work on two different kinds of, I mean, fiction, nonfiction, seeing how the sausage was made for both of those kinds of books is so different. Uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, getting to know people, uh, agents, uh, your production team. It's a lot of all of these kind of uh, people puzzles that I really enjoy because I've always loved talking to people, worked in a lot of food services before that. And I really kind of saw this in a lot of ways like a customer service job in addition to of course, looking, reading books and talking about books. Um, so there are a lot of things I loved about it. 
But at the same time, there are things I didn't love about it. And those are a lot of things that you will find in this book. And uh, sidebar cinema, I feel like there is a lot of over overlap. We will have to talk in terms of just like putting myself into the book and um, taking parts of like workplace culture that just make you cringe or make you go like, why is this this way? Um, and so I was thinking while I was writing this, a lot of people ask me like, how much of this is you? How much of this is actually what you experience? And I always say, you know, I was very lucky to not experience, uh, I'll just say the Colin incident. If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. I've not experienced that directly, but I know what it's like to work in a place that there are no people who look like you or there are very few people who look like you at the table. Um, there is a severe difference, um, of course, in how much money entry level uh, employees make versus uh, the people at the top. Um, and also how that affects your sense of self, I think. Um, and all of those kinds of things too about like, you know, what your role as an assistant is. Uh, how much autonomy do you have? All of those things are things that I put into my character, Nella. Um, and I should add, like, I started writing this while I was working in publishing still at my cubicle and really was just channeling all of those kind of, those things I'd been seeing uh, about class, um, but also just about what it's like to work in an office. Uh, it's weird. <laughs> there are a lot of things about it that are strange. Um, and we kind of, uh, in a lot of ways, give ourselves to that space. We give ourselves to companies um, and what does that mean when we do that and what does that mean when you're a young black woman who is the only black woman doing working in that space um, and how much of yourself can you give so going back to the book Nella is uh, like I said a young black woman who is trying to process lots of different things from working for uh, her boss, Vera, who is a, a waspy white woman um, who really wants Nella to kind of follow all of her rules um, and kind of takes parts of Nella that she wants and doesn't like the other parts, like say, her opinions that Nella has about certain authors of hers. And that is something that we see throughout the book, uh, this uh, continuing uh, desire for people, especially white people in these spaces to take from certain cultures and specifically in this book, black Americans, um, parts that they want and discarding the rest. And so I really wanted to explore that through Nella. So when I first wrote the draft of this book, so I started writing this book in January 2019, uh, and then I quit and uh, put my notice in in March because I had so much fun writing the book, starting it, I got so into it, uh, March 2019. And then in April 2019, that was my last day. And so I spent that summer of 2019 going into the characters, which first it started with Nella and Hazel, the two black women at Wagner Books, um, and really exploring their dynamic, what it's like to be the only one and then have another black person come into that space, all of the emotions that come with that. And then as I zoomed out though, I kept seeing um, just the world and why Nella would stay in a place like Wagner Books that doesn't give her the same return that she gives to Wagner. Um, why she feels this need to stay. And a lot of that comes from her desire to be the black editor that Wagner Books doesn't have, which is another thing that overlaps with me in terms of my time there, because when I quit, I felt guilty. I felt like I was letting down all of the potential black employees that could have worked there because just as when I was a kid, when I was writing, my dad would tell me, like write stories uh, about characters who look like you, because if you don't, who else will? I felt the same way while working in publishing. If, if you don't help other black people get into this space, who else will, right? And so, so that, that was something that I, I thought about and um, thought was important for me, but also it can be a weight to feel like that is just your responsibility. So, so I was exploring that. Um, and as I kept writing, sorry, going back to that summer of writing the book, I wrote this book through Nella's perspective. And then I stopped and I thought about Kendra Ray and Diana. So 
those are the two women that Nella really looks to to kind of push her forward, which is the same thing I often did when I was working in publishing. There are other Black women in publishing that I would get to know from other play, uh, imprints, other publishers. But then, of course, Toni Morrison, knowing she had done it once upon a time, kind of propelled me. So, so that is a thread of the book of Nella looking to Kendra Ray and Diana and their best-selling book that they published in the 80s at Wagner Books called Burning Heart. That is the thing that keeps her there. Um, and so after I wrote that first draft of Nella's voice, I was like, you know what? I feel like this story is missing something. It's bigger than just Nella. There needs to be more explanation and, and more uh, just more digging into those people who inspire her. So through Nella's eyes, we see this romanticized, like, oh, these two Black women working on this book. But then when we go back into their perspectives, we see that it was not that rosy. So, so there's a lot of that, too, of these expectations of what we uh, kind of hope to uh, get from reactions. Um, it's the ways in which we kind of assume people will do this because they're Black. Nella has her own prejudices. Everyone has prejudices and everyone in this book is very flawed in different ways. Uh, but I really wanted to touch upon all of those complexities within um, Black culture and within Black thought. Um, so Really quickly, I'm just going to say uh, a few themes of this book are that the fact that black people are not a monolith. Another one is female friendship and female frenemyship, um, especially in Wagner books between Nell and Hazel. And then, of course, Kendra Ray and Diana, their relationship is also very tense. Um, but I also should add that this book has some non traditional elements. It is uh, there are some speculative elements, I will say, otherworldly things that are at work in this book. Uh, and it's been fun hearing people's reactions because, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, how did you come up with this? Like, did you always know it would have this twist, this genre twist? And that's just who I am. I, I think stories that are uh, multi-genre stories are really effective. I love The Twilight Zone. Um, I love Black Mirror. I also just love horror, uh, Get Out, of course, Invasion of Body Snatchers, Night of the Living Dead, all of those kinds of stories that really comment on insidious social norms that we all accept. And I really wanted to question that. And I hope that readers reading this book will question those things as well and question themselves and their interactions with, with other people out in the world. Um, and I also hope this book is fun. I hope you have fun reading this because while there are a lot of really heavy topics on issues such as race, um, uh, politics, workplace politics, uh, diversity, and what does that even mean um, in a workplace in 2021. Um, all of those are things that I want to question, but I also want readers to have fun and really care about what happens to Nella and all of the characters in the book. Um, so, so that's the other Black girl in a nutshell. I could go on, but um, thank you so much. Thank you for listening and cannot wait to, to talk some more with all of you. Well, thank you so much for that, Zakia. Your book is absolutely riveting. I could not thank put you. it down. And we did have a question while you were chatting. Um, Christina is wondering if you had a particular audience in mind for your book, and have you heard anything about the reception from this demographic since you published it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Um, I think my my biggest thing that when I was writing, I was I was writing for myself. I was writing for that the, writing that book that like. Like I said, this book is very much me and all of its genres and the things that it talks about. Um, so I was really writing this book for Black women, especially Black women who have find, found themselves code switching and found themselves with their feet in kind of multiple spaces at once and trying to navigate that. So, so definitely Black women. And honestly, I've gotten, I mean, I screenshot a lot of the responses I get. I get DMs on Instagram and Twitter and just it really warms my heart because you never know, like when you're in your bubble writing, you just don't know how people are going to receive it and you just pour yourself out and hope that people will, uh, it will resonate with people and so to get that response has been really satisfying.
Well, congratulations. I know it certainly resonated with booksellers. In the early days Thank before you. this even hit the shelves, all of us were very excited about it. And we forecast great things, which I'm glad to see are coming true on the bestseller list and all the publicity you're getting. Um, you. One item I did want you to talk about, talk about the name Nella and where that came from. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I had started reading Passing um, in, right around the time that I, I got the idea for this book. And and Passing by Nella Larson. Um, and it really resonated with me because, I mean, a lot of that book is, so it's about uh, two Black women um, who are very, very light-skinned and are able to pass as white um, living in Harlem in the 1920s. And Nella and Hazel are, are Black. They look Black. You, they could not pass. Um, but I found a lot of, I saw, I, or I see a lot of similarities between the two main characters in Passing and Nella and Hazel because while they're not passing visually, uh, I do think code switching is, is a way of passing, of speaking a certain way, uh, the jargon, the publishing jargon, all of that, moving through that world uh, in a way that, you know, you're, you're assimilating essentially is, is something that I, I just saw so many parallels. And it's funny because when I was reading the book and when I was then started writing this book, I didn't even think about them necessarily. I mean, I thought about those like thrillery social kind of like what's going on here, like the subtext. But I, after rereading it recently, I was like, oh, wow, that book really influenced me. And I just I love the name Nella. I do too. Did you have an opportunity recently to see Britt Bennett with the New York Times discussing passing? Yes, I did. I that did. Was an excellent event. I'm sure it's archived oh, somewhere if people want to um, take a look at that. But yeah, Britt Bennett visited Lit Lovers quite a few years ago now with her first book, The Mothers. Mothers. And the vanishing Half, of course, is just flying out of the bookstore. Amazing. So it was Amazing. wonderful to hear her discuss that. And I think that yours is an excellent book to add to that canon. So oh, we're going to bring you. back um, our other friends, Renee and Tamima. And while they're getting their cameras revved back up, let's have a talk a little bit about cover art because we have had some questions. So maybe Zakia, you wanna talk about how your cover came to be? Yeah, sure. Um, so my agent and I, um, really we came up with a list of, of black artists because I, I knew when I started writing this um, I would kind of think about what this cover would look like and I knew it wanted I knew I wanted it to have an element of blackness that was undeniable unapologetic like as soon as you pick it up you know uh, besides the title because the title of course is it's it hints but I really wanted something that really showed it like in full force and so uh, we made this list we found so many wonderful authors online and and we sent it to my publisher at Atria and they just like nailed it they went and um uh found a beautiful artwork by piece of artwork by Timmy Coker um, called My Black is Beautiful and he made it for Juneteenth last year for Twitter I believe um, and he let us license the work and I'm just I'm I can't stop looking at it still like I, I feel like every time I see it it's it feels like the first time. It's very eye-catching when I got my box of author books for the program when we first met, that, that your cover just really made me pick it up and see what it was gonna be about. It really caught my eye. Tamima, how about you? How did you come to get your title and cover image all put together here? Did you have much input on that? Um, yeah, and I just wanna apologize for my backdrop. My internet has died and so I've moved into another part of my house. Um, so we're happy to have you anywhere. <laughs> cover is a really interesting question. Um, I was really thrilled that one of the things that happened when I decided to sort of write a new kind of book is that no one wanted to put any pictures of women in saris on my cover. And even my wonderful publishers with their best of intentions, obviously the, the, the woman in the sari, the, the exotic female figure is like a very established trope in cover design when you come from South Asia. The other thing is um, feet you will be amazed at the number of pictures of bare feet you will find if you look at books that come from the Indian subcontinent. So I was really glad that I wrote a book that could never have had a sari or feet in it um, or any sort of, you know, South Asian-y kind of, you know, all the cliches. Um, and basically my British cover and my American cover both have this 
picture of a woman with lightning bolts coming out of her head. And I just absolutely love it. Um, I just cannot get enough of it. And it's great, actually, um, as Zakia said, when, you know, it's one thing to write a book and you can be very proud of what's on the inside, but when you look at it, you can feel the sense of pride on the cover because it had nothing to do with you. I mean, obviously, Zakia, you had more to do with your cover because you came up with the short list, but having another artistic vision um, on the cover of your book feels like a great moment of collaboration and coming together with your publisher. So I love, I love this jacket so much. Great. Renee, can you pull your book jacket up closer to the camera so yeah. we can get Hang it? Hang on one closer? sec, let me. And let us know how you were able to select which historical image you wanted to put on there. So believe it or not, this is the first cover that they showed me. That never, ever, ever happens. <laughs> um, I just think it, you've got, I don't know if everybody can see in here, but I just felt like it captured the spirit of the book. It's a fun escape. It's a romp through the Gilded Age. I didn't change a thing. I, I actually, I, in my typical Renee style, started to overthink things. I'm like, well, what if the border's blue? And what if this? And I just went right back to this. So I was absolutely thrilled. I felt like they nailed the spirit of the book. Um, and uh, yeah, so well just, it's my baby. It's gorgeous. <laughs> And um, let's see, we have any other questions? Oh, um, author Priscilla Patton, who's joining us today from Minnesota, has a question for all of you. She wants to know about using humor or horror to address serious injustices or difficult topics and how you use that. Who would like to go first? Kia, you use both. So you should go first. <laughs> I was gonna volunteer you two to me, but I'll go. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I didn't mention that. So thank you, Priscilla, that there, I like to think there's humor in this book too. Um, because I think those two things are very important. Uh, I think they go hands in hand. And I think especially, um, like I mentioned earlier, like when you're talking about these really difficult topics, you really need to uh, you don't need to, but I wanted to have this, these other moments of levity in the book where the reader can kind of breathe um, so that also I can ramp up the tension later on. Uh, but yeah, like, so showing Nella in her out in the world um, with her best friend, having drinks, um, just like living her life, showing you what's really at stake um, and showing also that like we are full fledged, like we have these like hard things that we have to tackle, but also if that's like everything that that person's experience, it's it's too much. It's not relatable too, because we we as humans have to see the humor uh, with with the with the horror. And yeah, I also just think like, I mean, get out, I keep going back to it. I know it's always in conversation with this book, but but that movie is hilarious. And I think it's that much scarier because of how hilarious and how realistic it feels. Um, As I had said earlier, when somebody had asked about um, how the authors were selected today, you know, I said, just because I love these books so much, but at the same time, they do have a common theme of women trying to find their strength and their voice in society, yes. whether it's in the Gilded Age, in the workplace, um, in a startup up, however you're going to try and get your position and keep that position and um, yes. you know work through the societal constraints. So even though you all handle things extremely differently, it does have that theme running through it. So Tamima, please let us know how you're handling humor and humor. I, mean, I think that the, um, the, the way that I, I, I mean, what's real about humor is that when women get together to talk about their lives and usually whatever they're talking about is pretty serious, like facing discrimination in the workplace or dealing with some kind of issue in their relationships or children or marriages and divorces and miscarriages, whatever. Um, there's always a lot of laughing. I mean, when I get together with my girlfriends, we're all about the jokes. And so it, the, I wanted Asha's world to reflect as faithfully as possible, the kinds of conversations that women have with each other. And that had to be funny. People don't 
have earnestly serious sitting around the table, like let's talk about gender discrimination or let's talk about race in the workplace conversation. They're just like, man, that just happened and let's make a joke about it. So for me, it was trying to capture that real life kind of intimacy, humor, candor, and like the real sort of love between women, which I think is like a kind of untold love story in our modern age. Um, it's women who kind of get, get each other through these sort of difficult moments of their lives and challenging things with humor, so. Renee, I found your book to have a lot of humor woven through it as well. Yeah, you know, when I first started, I did, I always thought that the Gilded Age was really <laughs> stuffy. And, you know, I was, I couldn't have made this stuff up. You know, the, I think the humor just came out of their situations and how absurd their lives were. Um, and, you know, then as I got into it, I really did want to create a book that would offer escape. Um, especially the kind of like what you were saying, we've gone through such a horrific year and a half and, you know, let's get out of the heaviness. And, um, but honestly, um, the humor was just there in the research. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't funny to them at the time, but, you know, um, it, it just, I, like I said, I could not have dreamed this stuff up. Well, it was great. Well, it's getting to be time to wrap it up. I want to be respectful of everybody's lunch hour here. So I just want to thank all of you so much for joining us today. I could not be more grateful to you, Renee Rosen, Tamima Mom, and Zakia Dalil Harris. Congratulations to all of you on these fine works. There are shopping links in your chat boxes so that you can copy and paste and go right to the Valley Bookseller page. I did want to let you know what we have coming up next on July 6th at noon again, because once again, we have an author coming to us from Britain. We will have a lunchtime program with Kate Moore, who many of you will know from Radium Girls, whether you read the book or saw the Netflix show. And she will be discussing um, her new New work, work, The Woman They Could Not Silence. She will be talking about that with uh, Mary Casanova, one of our Minnesota novelists who has a book called Waterfall. That's a fiction book. Both of these are about women's rights and mental health. And anytime you hear the word insane asylum, you know that's going to be a good story. And <laughs> this is fantastic. And Kate Moore has uncovered the story of Elizabeth Packard, who, why she is not a household name, I do not know. She is an incredible woman in American history. And her book is historic, non historical nonfiction, reads like a thriller, it's amazing. Mary Casanova has an absolutely engaging novel called Waterfall, again, about a young woman whose family has put her in a mental institution against her will. This is gonna be an incredible conversation. So please register for that event, it's free. You can go to the Lit Lovers website. I've included it in the chat there, lit-lovers.com. And you can pre-order your copies of The Women They Could Not Silence or Waterfall or get them on the day of. All the details are on my website. Thank you for tuning in today. This will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. So later today, you'll be able to send that link to uh, friends if you want to share it or watch it again yourself, or if you had to cut out early for work. Thank you so much for supporting these fine authors, Renee Rosen, Tamima Anam, Zakia Harris. Thank you for shopping at Valley Bookseller because without your support, we can't keep the doors open and we certainly can't keep bringing you these wonderful programs. I hope you enjoy watching them as much as we do hosting them and sharing this information with you. So until we meet again, enjoy your shopping, have a wonderful summer. We'll see you back here on July 6th, right after the 4th of July holiday. And thank you again to these wonderful authors. Congratulations to all of you on these outstanding works of fiction. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.